Thank you so much, Chuck. Now, I appreciate your applause, but one thing I'm going to ask all of you to do is, for the rest of the evening until it's time, to hold all your applause or any other expressions of emotion so that we can spend all our time hearing from these wonderful candidates. Thank you to all of you for being here tonight and being interested in the political process because voting is something that we have the opportunity really and responsibility to do here in this country, in this state, in this county, and learning about our candidates is important. I also urge you to learn about the ballot issues on which we are going to be voting. The state and county don't really send out anything about the ballot issues, and please take the time to get the document that the League of Women Voters has prepared with pros and cons. It's in the back, and in fact, they may walk around and pass them out. I don't know. I would if I were they. <laughs> that was a hint. You think they got the hint? Regarding questions, we received an awful lot of questions, and I want you to know that if you don't hear your question asked tonight, there are other ways you might get it answered. There is another candidate forum with these candidates this coming Monday evening, October 13th, at Kealakehe High School at 6 o'clock. You may also watch this forum and other forums either online or on TV. Now, Leo Hawaii will have this forum probably starting next week. We have Hawaii247.com here. We have BigIslandVideoNews.com here. So you'll be able to relook what the candidates say about the issues. Remember that voting is November 4th, but walk-in voting starts October 21st around the island, five locations, and if you applied for an absentee ballot, they're actually in the mail now. You may also be able to pick up an absentee ballot application back at the League of Women Voters booth. And that's Miles Yoshioka. He's the executive director of the chamber. We love him. He's good. You can applaud him for sure. Okay, thank you so much again, as Chuck said, to you candidates for being here. This is very important to us to be able to hear your views on issues that are important to Hawaii Island folks. I'm going to now introduce the candidates, and please do hold your applause. And I'm going to introduce them by reading biographies that they themselves submitted. And we are doing all of this, as you can probably see, in alphabetical order. Duke Iona is running for governor with running mate and New Hope pastor and former judge Elwin Apu. Duke is a proud father to four children and a grandfather to two, Riley and Makana. Duke's children and grandchildren inspire his commitment to public service. Since retiring from the judiciary, Duke Iona has worked in private practice as a mediator and lawyer, a substitute teacher, and served Hawaii as lieutenant governor. Duke's diverse professional career enables him to bring a fresh perspective to leadership and decisive decision making. His initiatives for homelessness, affordable housing, and education have been widely viewed as innovative solutions for some of Hawaii's most pressing issues. Duke says his leadership style can best be summed up in three words, trust, respect, and balance. Mufi Hanuman is running for governor with running mate Les Chang, a retired Air Force colonel and formerly with city and county of Honolulu as head of parks and recreation. Mufi Hanuman was the 12th mayor of Honolulu, elected twice in 2004 and 2008. He was twice elected a Honolulu council member. He was its chair. The Iolani and Harvard Honors grad and Fulbright fellow was a special assistant to Governor Ariyoshi and was director of Department of Business, Economic Development, and Tourism under Governor Waihe'e. Nationally, Hanneman served in the Carter, Reagan, Clinton, and Bush administrations. He was a White House fellow under Reagan. He also held executive positions in the private and nonprofit sectors. Mofi Hanneman formerly resided on Hawaii Island, where he started the Punalu'u Bake Shop and Visitor Center. David Ige is running for governor with running mate, current Lieutenant Governor Shan Sutsui, formerly a state senator. Hawaii State Senator David Ige was raised in Pearl City with five brothers. He attended public schools. He earned a degree in electrical engineering and an MBA in decision sciences from the University of Hawaii at Manoa. He met his wife Dawn at UH. They have three kids currently in college. 
For 34 years, Senator Ige has maintained his job as an electrical engineering manager while also providing public service as a state legislator for 29 years in both the House and Senate. For 28 of those years, he was selected by his colleagues to lead many legislative committees, covering a range of subjects important to the people of Hawaii. So let's now give a warm Hawaii Island welcome to our candidates. And now to our forum, and please to remind you, no applause, no booze, no matter what you think of what they say. By the way, our timing tonight, courtesy of Vaughn Cook and Mary Bajir, the candidates have been introduced to the timing system, and they also know that when their time is up, their time is up. They know that I don't want to cut them off, but I may be forced to do so, and they understand that, so they get plenty of warning. So candidates, are you ready to begin? Absolutely. Okay. By the luck of the draw, a very complicated process we used. <laughs> the first question, and it will go to Mr. Iona first, is, and two minutes for this question, why are you running for governor? Two minutes, please. Aloha kako, aloha. I want to say thank you to the uh, sponsors of this uh, forum and also to all of you who are here tonight. I know uh, it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's time for you. I mean, you have very valuable time and for you to take the time off to come tonight uh, means a lot to not only me, but I think to the other two candidates. For me, the reason I'm running is I want to take you in a new direction. I don't want you to have the same system in order or just where you just change out the leaders and you have the same system. It's really about going in a new direction in regards to businesses, in regards to taxes and fees and, and everything else that we face in this island state of ours. But the real reason is because I believe my calling is for my grandchildren and my children. I'm at that stage of life right now where I believe I have that one last season of life. And just this past uh, couple of years, uh, my wife and I were blessed with a granddaughter, Riley, and a grandson, as you heard, Makana, we call him JP. And for those of you who are brand new, brand new grandparents, you understand my feeling and my emotion in regards to my grandchildren. And in looking at them, and also looking at my children, you know, it was upon me, upon a challenge from my wife, if this is really what I wanted to do, which was to walk away from all of this. Really, I had really thought about this and prayed about this. And if I would be able to look myself in the mirror and say I did everything I could to make things better for my grandchildren and my children. And obviously, the calling was simple. So I'm here to give you uh, an option and taking you in a new direction so that you don't have to just change out the players and, and have the same system in place. I thank you once again, Elwin, Ahu, and myself. We're here to bring trust, respect, and balance back to government. And we humbly ask for your vote on November 4th. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, 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 please, no applause. Senator Ige, two minutes, please. Why are you running for governor? I did also want to thank the Hawaii Island Chamber of Commerce and the sponsors of this forum here this evening. It really is important that uh, all of you have an opportunity to see the candidates side by side and listen to us responding to the issues that, that are most important to you. You know, I have had the privilege of working with your representatives in the state capitol for 29 years, three decades. Uh, and there have been so many projects that I'm proud of to be associated with the Big Island. You know, I still remember the first time I met with uh, Larry Kimura from Aha Punana Lelo, and he just expressed his concern that we would be losing native speakers, that we are down to the last 50 native speakers, and when we lose the language, we lose the culture. I am so proud to have been part of that groundbreaking up at UH Hilo to open the Hawaiian College, committed to perpetuation of the Hawaiian language, because I understand that the language is the culture and our host culture is so important to the state of Hawaii. Many people have asked me, why am I running for governor? I am running for governor because this election really is about the future of Hawaii. It's about the future that you and I want to leave to our children and our children's children. There are so many issues as I traveled across the state and I've listened and heard the concern 
for many of you, that government has become disconnected with the people, that it is no longer serving. I'm running for governor because I believe and I've heard that you want a change in leadership style. You want a leader that can bring our communities together rather than divide them. A leader who can find common ground and most importantly, find solutions that move our communities forward. Shan Tzu and I ask for your vote on November 4th. Thank you. Mr. Hanneman, two minutes. Why are you running for governor? Hello, my Kako. Hello, everyone. It's always a pleasure to come back to the Big Island. Many of my fondest memories continue to be when I was a resident and living in Naalehu and Pahala and also in Papaiko. I return tonight to ask you to consider for the next couple hours that we're with you, all the candidates will offer you ideas and solutions to make our place a better place to work, live and play. But I want you to think of yourself as an employer. You're looking to hire the next leader for the state of Hawaii. And when you do that, you look at their experience, you look at their qualifications, you look at their previous track record. This is a job for someone who has executive experience. This is a big job, 52,000 employees, billions of dollars of an operating budget. You have to be clear that that person can hit the ground running from day one. It's also a job that requires a governor to go to Washington, D.C. We've lost our perennial powerhouse back there in Senator Daniel Inouye. And so now more than ever, with a very young delegation, that governor has to go there and ask for federal assistance. I have a proven track record doing work in Washington, D.C., having worked with our delegation to save Pearl Harbor Naval Shipyard from closing. It also has to be a governor that has an international breadth of experience in dealing in the Pacific Asian region. I was there this afternoon talking to students at the University of Hawaii Hilo. I told them our future is in the Pacific Asian region. And what better way than to have a governor who has traveled extensively in that part of the world, has relationships, and can build upon that relationships to make Hawaii better place. So this is what we're facing with tonight. We ask you to listen very carefully and hopefully you'll come away with the feeling that Mufi Hanneman and Les Chang, a retired U.S. veteran of 30 years, are the best team to move Hawaii forward. Mahalo. Thank you. Thank you. This next one is going to go to Mr. Iona first and this is a one-minute question. You're a Republican, so tell us what the key principles are of the Republican Party and how they will guide your administration. One minute, please. I have my principles, and my principles are very, very simple. It is about trust, it is about respect, and it's about balance. In traveling across the state, first and foremost, people have told me we don't trust our public servants. Why don't you trust your public servants? Because they don't respect our ideas, our dreams, and our fears. They're not listening, they're not responding, and as such, we are out of balance when it comes to our government. I think uh, you don't have to look too far to know that we're number one in a lot of things that we don't want to be. And that's why I said in my opening remarks, we need to go in a new direction. Those are our principles, and when I say our, I'm talking about myself and my running mate, Elwin Ahu, and it's very simple. Trust, respect, and balance. Thank you. Mr. Hanneman, you're an independent. What are the key principles of the independent party, sort of an unknown party in this state? And how will that guide your administration? One minute, please. The Independent Party is all about representing the people, putting people first, as opposed to the party. For too long, we've been mired in partisan gridlock. We've seen that in Washington, D.C. We've seen that locally when a Republican governor was in the state office and had great difficulty getting things through an entrenched Democratic majority. We've also experienced gridlock with the Democratic governor, our current Democratic governor, not finding common ground with the Democratic legislature. So what about trying something different, something new? We're all about the people, putting people first. That's why I want to do an inter-island ferry service. I've heard resoundingly from people throughout the neighbor island state of Hawaii, they want that. And that's why I'm responding to it. That's why I did rail on Oahu. I heard resoundingly that people wanted rail. And I govern in a nonpartisan environment as a nonpartisan mayor of the city and county of Honolulu. So if you want a party that will put you first, the answer is the independent party. Thank you. Mr. Ige, as a Democrat, talk about how the key principles of the Democratic Party will guide your administration. One minute only, please. 
Thank you. You know, the Democratic Party has always been the party of the people. We put people first. It's about fighting for the working class, fighting for living wages. It, it's about being compass compassionate and ensuring that those less fortunate are cared for as well. It's providing that safety net. Uh, it's making investment in public education and public schools and caring about the environment. You know, I've served in the state capitol with three simple principles that I will bring to the governor's office. Be open and honest in communication. Be lis listen and be respectful of all views. And then most importantly, do the right thing the right way. You know, these are my guiding principles. It fits in very nicely with the priorities of the Democratic Party. And I look forward to the opportunity uh, to being able to serve you. Thank you. Mr. Hanneman, this question goes to you first. And this is a one minute question that will go to all of you. We have a lot of questions, obviously, from the audience that have been submitted over the last weeks, things that concern people on this island. But before we get to those, what are your top priorities that will affect Hawaii Island? We're not asking for your full plan, just what are your top priorities? One minute, Mr. Hanneman first, please. When I was mayor of Honolulu, I said the most important job of a county mayor is public health and safety. I'm saying as governor, the most important responsibility is education. The most important goal is improving the economy, and they work together hand in hand. The Big Island has been experiencing some major difficulties in jobs and making sure that people can stay on the Big Island, and also the challenges that you face in your education system. What about someone now who has that experience of looking at a budget and not just cutting, 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 but looking at ways to grow the economy, taking advantage of the natural assets you have here on the Big Island? astronomy, sciences, agriculture, tourism, and bringing that to pass so that we can have our children want to stay here. What about a governor that's going to feel very passionately about education to make sure that education is going to be the highest priority and that we don't cut unnecessarily and we grow that so that our kids can be employment ready, college Thank ready, you. and citizenship Thank ready. Thank you, Mr. Hanneman. Senator Ige, what are your top priorities for this island? As always, I really do believe it's public education. Public schools um, form the foundation of our community. It really is the enabler that allows our children to dream and pursue uh, their big ideas for a place uh, in the 21st century. Um, yeah, I've been a big supporter and proponent of charter schools. There are more charter schools here on the Big Island than any other island. Uh, so it really is about uh, bringing balance. I was proud to be able to support the new science te technology building at White Mountain Middle School because it is such an vital asset for our communities. Uh, it is about finding balance in management of our natural resources. We need to find a way to recognize hunters and those fishermen when, whenever we look at rules that guide uh, management of our resources. And then third, it's about the economy. We need to open that international terminal at Kona Airport because it provides huge access and benefit to Thank the you. entire state. Thank you. Mr. Iona, one minute. Your priorities for this island. The priorities for this island are no different from those across the state. Farmers, they're small business owners. I'm the only candidate that is making this commitment, and that is real simple. When we get elected, we're going to put a sign out there that says, Hawaii is open for business. I am committed to promoting the best positive business environment that you can find by simply getting government out of the way of small businesses. And all of you, many of you in this room are small businesses because we know that 99% of our businesses here in Hawaii are small businesses. That's a commitment that you're only going to hear from me. I will find the ways to cut regulations, to cut fees, to make life that much simpler for all of our business people so they don't have to go through these barriers, so that they can thrive. And when small businesses thrive, what do they do? They create jobs, and they create jobs that will pay a livable wage. So it's really about how do we expand the economy, and there's more to it than just what I said, but that's gonna be my constant underlying thing. Thank you, thank you so much. We're gonna to go to Senator Ige for the next question, which is a two minute question. Hawaii County is dealing with disaster recovery and preparation as we both recover from the storm Izell and deal with lava that is creeping towards Pahoa Village, really pretty definitely. 
This is clearly an unusual situation. We'd like to know what role can and should the state play in helping Hawaii County. Two minute question to Senator Ige first. Thank you. Um, I am very much aware of the challenges presented by Hurricane Isel as well as the lava flow approaching Puna. You know, I've had several conversations with Mayor Billy Kinoy and his concern uh, as these natural disasters have progressed. I have visited the farms in Puna, uh, looking at the damage, asking and talking with farmers about how we can help improve them. As you all know, the mayor of the city and county of Hawaii really is the lead person uh, for natural disasters. But the state does play an important and critical role. I talked with Lieutenant Governor Shan Tsutsui just a couple days ago about the emergency declaration and the challenges of having that bypass road ready should the Highway 130 be overrun by lava. Uh, we and the state has taken action uh, to, by executive order, transfer that road so that Mayor Kinoi can do what he believes he needs to do to assure the people of Puna have continued, and all of the island actually, with the power plant and access to a stable electrical grid. Um, so the state, in supporting the county, uh, can, can do a lot of different things. Uh, to, we support the emergency de declaration with the federal government. We can provide services that are critical uh, for those areas that are beyond the capacity on just the county of Hawaii. So uh, as if elected governor, if you give me that privilege, I would look forward to continuing to work with Mayor Kinoy uh, and, and the rest of the county delegation uh, as we respond to and take action on these emergency situations. Thank you. Mr. Hanneman, what role can and should the state play in this unusual disaster situation? As you all know, I have a strong personal working relationship with Mayor Billy Kinoy. And the model that I have set up to face every issue, whether it be a crisis or problem, is the Hawaii Council of Leaders, made up of the governor and four mayor counties of the mayor, mayors of the counties. You see, what we need is a collaborative approach. I'm the only one standing before you tonight it's actually had to work with the civil defense because it was called the Department of Emergency Management at the city and county of Honolulu. So it's all about being proactive before the disaster occurs. And most importantly, I'm the only one standing before you tonight. When I was a director of business under Governor Waihe'e and they shut down Hamakua Sugar, we had to come up with a proactive plan to make sure those displaced agricultural workers had some place to go and what would we do with those agricultural lands. So I am prepared to work in a collaborative way, bringing together all the counties, bringing together the full resources of the state and also the federal government of which I'm very familiar with because we may not be able to fully recover with strictly state funds. We're gonna need federal assistance. We're gonna need the help of everyone throughout the state of Hawaii to ensure that whatever occurs in Puna or whatever may occur in the future, that we'll be proactive about it, not reactive, but have a plan in place to ensure that wherever these situations occur, we're ready to step up to the plate. I too have been down to Puna uh, recently. I've always been familiar with Puna when I was on this side of the island, well aware of the potential that exists there. And certainly the farmers are also very worried because of the damage which occurred with Izel. So someone with my background and experience will be much more better prepared to deal with this disaster, but most importantly, do it in a collaborative fashion where we all can learn from each other here locally in case this happens in any other part of the state. Thank you. Mr. Iona. I think all of us on this stage, our hearts go out to the, uh, the residents and the people of the Puna area. Like my colleagues, I've had the opportunity to not only visit the, uh, the area, but also to speak with the, uh, the leaders and the residents in the area. And I know what they're facing. I need to correct the record uh, in regards to uh, experience with uh, civil defense. I had the privilege uh, when serving as lieutenant governor, and I should say it's a privilege, it was a, it was a call to duty uh, when, the, uh, when we had the, uh, the earthquake on the uh, Kona site uh, about six or seven years ago. And uh, at that time, Governor Lingo was here on the island and I was back home on Oahu and we split the duties in regards to responding to that. So I understand the role that the, the state plays in, in civil defense. 
Mr. Eady is right. The, uh, the county government takes the lead in any, any emergency situation such as we have now. And I think there are two things that we need to look at. First and foremost, the immediate concerns. And I believe, based on my conversations and my observation of the area and speaking to the residents, that the uh, county government and the state government are working well together along with all other uh, emergency personnel. I'm confident of that and I'm, I'm, I'm thankful for that. I think they're ready for what may possibly happen, but it's the longer term. It's that second step. What happens after this lava flow is taking its path. That's the one that really is going to take, uh, I think, yeoman work by, by the state as well as the county, but more so with the federal government too. And this is where leadership is going to come in in regards to doing what's right for the people of Hawaii so that we can take care of those essentials. And these essentials are basically their lives, their homes, their businesses, school, and everything else that is, uh, that is in that area and that will be affected. So it's, it's not something that you look forward to, but it's something that you will rise to the challenge for because of the past experience that we've had in regards to working on natural disasters. Thank you. All of you have mentioned education as key priorities. So we're going to jump into education now. And I'm going to start with higher education, a two-minute question. It's number eight. Today, about 42% of working-age adults here in Hawaii have a two- or four-year college degree. That's what the U.S. Census says. On this island, it's about 36%. Hawaii's educational leaders have set a goal of having 55% of working age adults holding a two or four year degree by the year 2025. And starting with Mr. Iona, a two minute question, what is it going to take to make that happen? And particularly, how will that happen here on Hawaii Island? Two minutes, please. And if I can just add to that statistic, I think in 2018, about 65% of the workforce is gonna be required to have a a degree that's much more than a high school degree. So in other words, an associate degree and or higher. And so that, that time frame comes down from the 2020 uh, uh, time period. And so it's, for us, the platform is simple. It starts with our public education system and how it's being run and structured and governed right now. So we have basically three things we want to do right off the bat. First and foremost, we want to conduct, we will conduct an independent financial and management audit of the Department of Education. We need to see where the inefficiencies are in regards to our finances and in regards to management. From that, we know what we can do. Now, it's gonna take some time, it's gonna take an investment, but I believe it's worth it. Because what we need to do, we know it's not working right now, is we need to change the governance structure of our Department of Education. A recent survey showed that many of our principals cower with fear because of the top-down management style or administration style of the current DOE. And that has to change. And so I will adopt a, a, a platform that has been put forth now by an independent think tank that just started here in Hawaii. In fact, uh, they're out on a, on a field trip observation to, uh, I believe it's LA, San Francisco, and Vancouver. And it's called School Empowerment. The details are not worked out, but it's a very simple structure. It's a restructuring so that we give the principals, the teachers, the parents, and the community the ability to develop their own curriculum, their ability to administer the finances they have in their schools, and of course, to provide a curriculum that's best suited for their students. And the reason for that is so that their students can be able to ready and they'll be will willing to thrive in this 21st century, this knowledge-based economy. And last but not least, something called the Early College Program, which will give our students an AA degree and high school diploma upon their graduation. Thank you. Um, Mr. Hanneman, we're really focusing on college issues right now. How do we get our population to get their college degrees, two or four year, since that is what is going to be needed in the future? And particularly, we want to look at Hawaii Island. Two minutes, please. So my wife was a founding member of P20 that said that ambitious goal of 5525 that 55% of our adults by the year 2025 will either have a two or four year degree. That's why I was at University of Hawaii Hilo today. I spent a lot of time in the college campuses trying to learn from the students, faculty, administrators what's going on. We need to set high goals. We need a leader in a government that's going to understand the importance of education. As I said earlier, the number one responsibility of a governor is education. So if the legislature is going to make cuts to the budget, that governor has to be proactive 
in sending that budget down. Because if it's all about making sure that our students want to go to college and get an advanced degree, the funding will be there. One of the big worries today at University of Hawaii Hilo was that the cost of tuition continues to rise, and they're concerned about that. So it's important that the governor recognize that. If cuts are going to be made, there are wise cuts, as opposed to cuts to hit a certain mark because you want to cut the budget by 800 million. The second thing is you need a governor that's going to grow this economy so that we will have money for education. So we're not looking as an option to raise your taxes as the legislature often does in a proposal to raise the GET by 25%. We don't have to do it that way. Grow tourism, grow agriculture, work with the private sector, do public-private partnerships, and how about if a governor that can go out in the Pacific Asian region and call upon those contacts and relationships that he's made through the years. Today I'm a professional consultant in that part of the world. I want to ask them, many of whom who have a stake in Hawaii, many of them who have been educated here, come and help the University of Hawaii Hilo, help the Hawaii Community College. We have a special niche opportunity, especially in the fact that we do draw students from the Pacific region. Why not go and say, let's do it the Pacific way. You help us, we help you. That's what we need, leadership now more than ever, a governor who embraces education Thank and you. can promote education in a strong way. Thank you. Senator Ike, let's talk about how we're gonna get people on this island to have two or four year degrees. Two minutes, please. Thank you. I believe it starts with making strategic investments in infrastructure. Uh, I was proud to be able to support the construction of the Hawaiian College uh, campus up at UH Hilo uh, because it really becomes the center for training educators and, us, and those interested in perpetuation of the Hawaiian language uh, to have a home and a place to focus. Uh, and it really provides the opportunity at all the full range of educational opportunities from training teachers to getting into assessments uh, and to uh, planning curriculum about what that language would look like. You know, I made and supported uh, investment in the Palamanui facility over on the west side because I do understand uh, when students are attending classes in the middle of a shopping center, it just doesn't seem like a college campus. Uh, so those investments are very important. And I do know the location of uh, Hawaii Community College is a big issue here. We've uh, funded uh, various planning studies so we can move forward and find a way so that that campus can expand to meet the future needs of your community. It has to happen on a couple of different levels. I, can, I can't wait until the Palamanui campus is open because it is envisioned as an education center, a portal or gateway for those living on the west side to the full range of opportunities that the University of Hawaii system, all campuses all across the state, can provide for our communities. It really is talking about 21st century education, not limiting what the options are by the physical location and the courses that may be offered there, but really dreaming about what the 21st century education looks like and so any student can get access to any program anywhere. Thank you. I'm gonna jump back to K through 12 education, which is clearly the basis for our educational system here in the state. And I'm gonna start with you, Senator Ige. You have stated in several candidate forums that you feel the best path forward for K through 12 education system is empowering schools, giving those closest to the children resources and authority to make a difference. Could you be specific as to what you really mean and what the implications would be for Hawaii Island? Two minutes. Absolutely. I believe and have witnessed myself that having the leader at a campus or at a school really makes tremendous difference. I've had a school in my district that have been underperforming for a decade. Uh, and with the change in the right leader, the school went from being below average or near the bottom for middle schools to the highest performing middle school in the state in two years time. I truly understand what difference uh, leadership at the campus makes. So, you know, it's really holding the, the Board of Education and the superintendent accountable for walking the talk. They talk about empowerment, but their actions don't demonstrate it. They talk about empowering principles, but they dictate what curriculum, how the money should be spent, what books should be purchased. 
they believe that one size fits all. I think that that's absolutely crazy. Every school is different, every community is different. So it talks about aligning the policies and procedures in the department with the words that are spoken. Empower schools, deliver resources to the school level, let the community and the leaders at the school take the resources and make the most important decisions about how the children should learn uh, and, and how we can support them better. You know, education really is about um, the interaction between teacher and student in the classroom. You know, I do have a 52-year a uh, relationship with the public school system, and I've seen it. I benefited from many inspiring teachers uh, who taught me to dream big and, and pursue those dreams. I believe that it comes from giving those closest to the children the authority and resources to do what's best for them. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Hanneman, your campaign website also speaks to decentralizing decision-making authority to principals and teachers. So please be specific as to what you mean and how it would work here on Hawaii Island. Two minutes. Every year for the past 20 years, I go to 40 to 45 public schools throughout the state. I give out scholarships, I give out book awards, I read to them. I even take an all-girls high school basketball team uh, to the main and always consisting of Big Island female basketball players because they do so well. But here's the bottom line. I believe that if you empower our area complexes, our principals, our teachers, and let them come up with a creative way to develop curriculums that will engage our students, that's the way to go. On a while, there's this principal named Keith Hayashi at White Powell High School. He has turned that school around despite some of the barriers that exist with the current system. In that particular school, they do college pathways, they do early college, where they have a synergism with Leeward Community College. There's another school, Ka Kaimuki High School, that was experiencing declining enrollment. And what he did too, he did college pathways, and they have an early college program with Kapiolani Community College. At the end of the day, they need to know that a governor has their back. They need to know that in differences they may have with the Department of Education or the Board of Education, the governor will be able to sit down and have a talk story session with them. I have great concerns with the Common Core curriculum. I believe in standards. Sometimes they foist upon our educators too much paperwork where they're spending filling out forms as opposed to being in the classroom engaged with the students. I disagree with the Pono Choices aspect of Common Core. So this is why we have to have that flexibility. What works for New York or California may not work for Hawaii. What works for Kaimoki may not work for Hilo, Waikea, or, or Konawaina. And having that flexibility, making sure they know you have to decentralize decision making, I believe at the end of the day will create a better learning environment where the kids are going to want to come to school, the teachers are going to want to teach, and the principals are going to be proud to stand with them and give them their high school Thank diploma. You. Thank you. Mr. Iona, your opponents have talked about decentralizing decision-making as one way to make K through 12 better. What is your plan? Two minutes. You know, I had the, uh, the blessing of being a substitute teacher for the past uh, two years in my community. It was uh, elementary school in Kapolei Elementary and Holomoa Elementary. There's two takeaways from that. First and foremost, I note that teachers need time to teach. Very simple. Second, we need more parental involvement. Those two things alone, I can guarantee you student achievement will go out the roof. More importantly, I think that will inspire them to do what they need to do educationally. Now, I had the opportunity to be up here not too long ago, and uh, I visited with uh, Punana Leo and Navai. It's, uh, it's, I guess you could say it's feeder charter school. Charter schools are the, the prime example of what I talked about earlier about school empowerment, giving them the ability to be flexible with their curriculum and their administration. And what does, what's the beauty of Punana Leo? And I hope this can be modeled throughout the state of Hawaii. Parental involvement. Starting at that very early age, parents are involved with the education of their children, and they carry that forward to the charter school. And so what you see is active engagement. You see students, as it was mentioned by, by Mufi, wanting to come to school. Teachers want you to come to school. So that model in and of itself says it all. We have uh, also 
stumbled upon, I guess you could say, a program called Early College. It's similar but not the same as the early college programs that we have now in our public school system. Unlike those, this is not about earning college credits or taking college courses or inspiring you to be college uh, students. It's about actually getting an AA degree. And the beauty of it all is that the businesses will be a part of it. The businesses will be the mentors and provide the pathway to employment for our students. These are the kinds of innovations, these are the kinds of specific programs we need to inspire our students to be college ready and to be college graduates. Thank you. I'm going to ask for a 30 second follow up from each of you. When you talk about decentralizing Senator Ige, are you talking about having local school boards with a school board here on Hawaii Island? 30 seconds. No, it really is about ensuring that the regulations and the dictates from the board really follows the talk. It's stopping to ordering what books should be uh, purchased or when they should uh, purchase uh, computers. It really is about delivering the money to the school and letting them decide when it would be appropriate and what's appropriate to be purchased. It's really a matter of ensuring that the board walks the talk. Mr. Hanneman, are you talking local school boards? I think it's the only one that has executive experience in working with a multi-department and the like. I'd like to try it with what we have now. They'll know that there's a new sheriff in town. They know that he's going to require the Board of Education to adhere to this policy that the governor would like to see to empower decentralization decision-making process. And I believe I'd like to try that out before we say we're going to have a local school board. I really believe uh, there are dedicated DOE personnel, there are dedicated Board of Education members, but if a whole new philosophy is set and a whole new goal of objectives to make sure that we Thank don't you. just talk about Thank it you. and make it happen. Thank you. Mr. Iona, local school boards? That would be optimal, but that's not the structure that I have envisioned. You would still have the school board at the top, but their role would change dramatically. Right now, it comes from the top down. The administration, the direction, you have principals that say they feel like compliance officers. All they're doing is checking off. This will move the authority making, the direction, and the curriculum making all to the schools, empowering the principals, the students, and the teachers. Thank you. I have another 30 second follow up question. It's going to go to you first, Mr. Iona. The previous Republican administration and the state legislature made a decision to save money by having children go to school four days a week by instituting what was called furlough Fridays. There were many ramifications, obviously, the, to that decision. Would you again consider cutting down the school day or week for budget balancing? 30 seconds only. Absolutely not. That was something also that uh, I need to refresh everyone's memory, was a decision that was made between the employer and the employees. But I would definitely not uh, institute that. Uh, again, if it came to that point where the budget had fallen out, I mean, I should say the, uh, the, the, uh, the economy had fallen out like it had in 2007, and a decision such as that has to be made. But remember, it was a, it was a uh, agreed upon uh, um, uh, uh, decision, and unfortunately it came down to that. Thank you. Senator Ike, would cutting the school day or week be an option for you? Uh, absolutely not. Uh, I would like to remind the voters that that was a unilateral decision uh, made by the employer. Uh, and employees to really take away classroom time. You know, our children are so precious, uh, you never get that opportunity to, to get those uh, days back. And clearly it would never happen. Mr. Hanneman, would that be an option for you? I, the only one here that's had to do collective bargaining and deal with unions, that would be something I would say would be off the table. I would have never instituted or agreed to Furrow Fridays. I've said the top responsibility of the governor is education. Our kids need to be in school. Our kids need to be taught as opposed to being short shrift because of furlough Friday decision that was made by the previous administration. Thank you. We're going to jump into hospitals and health care right now. We're going to ask Mr. Hanneman to take this one first. The reality of the financial and operational problems of Hawaii Island's two state hospitals should be evident. HHSC, the parent, the state parent, is doing layoffs because of lack of funds, and there is no apparent plan to upgrade our hospitals to meet future demands. The state legislature has either failed to grasp the magnitude of the problem or is unwilling to do what's needed, even in the face of the state hospitals making proposals as to what they think would be possible solutions. 
to provide a very viable future path. If you are the governor, what specifically will you do to find a solution to that problem, understanding that we on this island have two state hospitals? Two minutes, please. I'm the first candidate in this campaign to come out and say, we need a new model. It's public-private partnerships. It's on my website, votemofi.com, where I went into great detail. The time has come. Yes, the legislature has been kicking the can down the road. There was a bill before the legislature that would enable public-private partnerships to emerge. It didn't happen. And all I hear are excuses. Oh, we didn't have a private sector company at the table. Oh, we couldn't work it out with the unions. What could be more important than patient-centered health care? It shouldn't matter where you reside. You shouldn't have to come to Honolulu. You should have it here. And the model exists, and it exists very well. You have that with North Hawaii Hospital, with Queens Medical Center. You've seen on Kauai with Wilcox in Hawaii Pacific. We've seen it in Oahu, where St. Francis was basically going under, and Queens stepped in there. That's what we need. We need a governor who can sit at the table, work with the unions, all of them I've had working relationships in the past. We never had an acrimonious disagreement on anything that we talked about when I was mayor and doing collective bargaining. And I really believe that there's things to work out. The unions have a good case to be made. They are complaining that those administrators at the health system are making too much money. Let's look at that. Let's see where we can find common ground. But the situation is intolerable for the legislature to continue to kick the can down the road. Last year, the operating loss was $165 million. And so here's the game that is played. They come before Senator Hege, they ask for funding, they underfund them, then they come back with emergency appropriations, and they continue to underfund them. This has to stop. And you need a governor who's strong enough, wants to do this to make sure that anyone who's under a state hospital system is going to have quality health care no matter where they reside. And I'm willing to take that on and make it a major priority Thank from you. day one. Thank you. Mr. Iona. <clears throat> I'll agree with uh, Mufi that it is a top priority uh, with my administration. This has been going on for far too long. I remember in, uh, when I was uh, Lieutenant Governor, I believe it was around 2004, the legislature commissioned a report, it's called the Stroudwater Report, and they commissioned it with your funds, about a quarter of a million dollars of your funds. And what did they do with that report? Well, it's on a shelf right now. Never looked at it, never considered it, and as such, we are where we are right now. But enough said about that. What we need right now is exactly what was, was said, and that'll be our priority. But, you know, it, it, involves a, a, it involves a situation in which we have to sit down and understand the gravity of it all, the urgency of it all, and the necessity of it all. So obviously, we would convene, and that's probably the, one of the, uh, the, the greatest uh, tools that a governor has, is to convene. And I would convene a, a meeting, a discussion, uh, whatever you want to call it, but it will be a discussion that would result with a solution. In other words, the stakeholders, the administrators, the unions, the employees, the legislators. Everyone who needs to be at that table will be at that table. And whether it's a public-private partnership with a local company or a privatization of the system or whatever it takes so that we can finally put this to rest, that's what will be done because it is that urgent. There's only a few things that I have on my list right now in regards to what needs to be done fiscally in the state of Hawaii and that is one of them. So you have my commitment to make this happen. Thank you. Senator Ige. If you're the governor, what are you going to do to fix our state hospital problem, which affects us here on this island more than almost anybody? Uh, thank you very much for that question. I know many of you um, know that I served as the chair of the health committee prior to taking over as chair of the Ways and Means Committee. Uh, so I have uh, spent many hours uh, speaking with West Low CEO at Maui Memorial and Howard Ainsley uh, before he um, changed jobs to talk about the future of the Hawaii Health Systems Corporation. I was successful in passing legislation in my last year as chair of the health committee that provided a pathway to move from the current system, uh, totally state controlled, into some other form of partnership. At that time that we laid out that plan, 
we did not have a suitor and we did not have a specific uh, entity or business that was willing and able to step forward. So yes, it was broad-based. It provided a structure and a pathway to allow it to happen. Unfortunately, it hasn't. As part of that measure, I know that a challenge in the, in the hospital system is that one, under the state process, civil service, one contract applies to all employees, whether they um, work in a hospital, which is a 24-7 operation, or they work in the standard office, where it's an eight to five operation. I know that hospitals need a different kind of contract, and employees that work in the hospitals need to have contracts that are suited to 24-7 uh, operations. I am running for governor because I understand that the governor has to be actively involved in talking with partners, in negotiating with the unions, because I've tried it from the other side, and it's virtually impossible to do. I understand what's required. I've had discussions with private sector uh, opportunities. I do know that the, there are labor issues that need to be worked with, and I'm running for governor to be able to help fix the hospital system. Thank you. We're going to ask you to stay on your feet, Senator Ige, because you're up next for a question about efficiency. We can cite many examples of lack of efficiency within state government. The state discourages people from paying taxes and registering cars online by charging a fee for what should cost the state less. The Advertiser had a recent article that says Hawaii's administrative cost for building roads is the highest in the country. The state is very slow in paying its vendors, causing problems, particularly here for small businesses. These are examples, and we're not going to ask you gentlemen to address any one issue. What we're going to ask you to do is give us your overall take on what you could do, what you will do, to bring Hawaii into this century in implementing state-of-the-art technology and processes. Two minutes, Senator Ige. Thank you very much for that question. You know, over the, my four years as uh, chair of the Ways and Means Committee, I have appropriated uh, more than $200 million for investing in the IT infrastructure of state government. I believe that public employees need the tools to be more efficient. And our financial management system, our budgeting system, our tax collection system is so old uh, that they are all manufactured discontinued and not supported by the manufacturers. So I do believe it begins with making investments in those core systems that allows our employees to be more efficient. And let me just give you one real example. I was asked by the Senate President to lead the paperless initiative at the State Senate. I've always believed by leading by example. So I took that position and in one year, we reduced paper consumption by 85% We've reduced the number of, of positions and we've redefined and re-engineered all of the processes of the legislative process. And I think the end result was we deliver better services, more access, more documents uh, at a lower cost to you, the taxpayer. I'm confident that if I can do that for the Hawaii State Senate, I can bring that energy, commitment, and strategy to the executive branch and find solutions uh, to integrate technology that will allow us to be more efficient and more effective on your behalf. Thank you. Mr. Iona, we'd like your take on how you're going to bring the state into the 21st century, make us more efficient. It, it starts with a commitment to being transparent. And I've said this earlier in other forums and debate, it all starts with me. And so that transparency will start with the executive office and work its way into the departments. Being lieutenant governor for uh, eight years, I saw what advancements we had made at that time, but also saw the challenges that we had in state government. And part of it was uh, what was mentioned by David in regards to some archaic systems, but more importantly, the silos that we have in these various departments when it comes to IT. I commend the Abercrombie uh, administration for uh, designating an office of, uh, of IT and a chief IT officer. That's something that's needed. But you also heard David say something else, and that is the cost that is involved. It's going to be a tremendous cost, and again, it's a matter of priorities, and can we do it? But I do know this. Within each department, within each agency, within different levels of government, transparency can be much better. Thus, making it that much better for efficiency, 
because what happens when you have transparency, you now know what's happening in government. So with the permitting process that we have, why can't that be tracked you know, on the website? Just like how UPS does it. You, know, you track your package. Why can't we do that in government? We have the infrastructure for that. It's just a matter of leadership in making that happen. How much would that cost? Not very much, but it can be done. So likewise, you know, in, when it comes to uh, transparency, when it comes to efficiency, those little changes will be made, but I'm committed. I'm committed to doing the best that we can in regards to changing out the systems that we have now so that it can be transparent for all of you. So you can see it, it, what's happening, and as a result of that, it'll be much more efficient. Thank you. Mr. Hanneman. I appreciate what Senator Ige did to change the culture in the Senate, but you're really talking about 25 senators and their staff. I did it at the city and county of Honolulu for the 13th largest city in the United States with 10,000 employees. We changed the culture overnight. When I left office, we were the leading digital city in America. We got rid of 20-year-old computer mainframes. We brought in interoperability where the police could talk to the fire, the fire could talk to the lifeguard. We spent more time making sure that customers went online than standing in line. Let me give you a very egregious example that's happening with conveyance tax, which is very important to the counties. That conveyance tax is not being processed expeditiously. Why? They're not using technology. They're still doing it manually. That delays the real property tax assessments that have to go from the county. It makes them worry, figuring out how are we going to value or figure out the property taxes and the like. This will be a major priority. I know how to fix that problem because we did it at the city and county of Honolulu. The state continues to work in silos. By the time I left the city, everything came out of the Department of Information and Technology. And if there's not enough money, I'll reach out to the private sector. That's what happened when Governor Abercrombie set up his Office of Technology. The Omidyar, the Omidyar Foundation came forward and helped to fund it. You see, it takes a governor with that kind of experience and the breadth of being able to reach out into the private sector there's not enough funding to do something that we should be doing so desperately because at the end of the day, you want government to be customer friendly. If we're not customer friendly, you'll continue to be turned off by government and we don't want that to happen. This is the 21st century and we need to bring everybody together and I will take that same idea to the Hawaii Council of Leaders so that all the counties and the state of Hawaii are on the same page improving technology so that they can become a leading county of the digital technology. I'm going to ask a one minute follow up on that same topic of all of you. And Mr. Iona, you really mentioned this, that the governor did the right thing in bringing in the Office of Information Technology and a really very nationally respected guy to hit it. And Mr. Hanneman, you mentioned that there was funding, but we generally have a perception that many state employees are not comfortable with these kinds of changes. So it speaks to the whole issue of changing culture. How will you bring the employees on board? And we'll start with you, Mr. Ionan. As I mentioned earlier, and of course it's uh, oversimplified, I believe, by, by MUFI in regards to the cost and the transition. This is not something that just happens overnight, nor do you just go out and recruit someone and get some money. What, what, was, what was given was the opportunity to develop something that could take, would, would happen, but would take time. And the chief information officer that Governor Abercrombie recruited is no longer with the state. He left uh, about a, a few months ago, uh, rather abruptly I'd say, and so right now that program is in limbo. But it was in limbo before that because it was about the cost and it was about changing some of that culture. So it's something again that, that takes a lot of planning, it takes, a, you know, it takes a lot of resources, it needs to be done, and, and it will be done, given the time and given the expertise. Mr. Hanneman, how will you change the culture? How will you bring the employees on board? That's exactly what we faced at the city and county of Honolulu initially when we talked about doing this. So what a leader does, and I've had experience in having a cabinet, I brought them all together, and I said this is a need to have as opposed to ignoring it. We have to go into the 21st century. So everyone came together, they collaborated to make sure that this was as good for them as it's good for the customer. And if they needed more training, we provided that training. And that's what it's gonna take. It's not about no can, no can, no can. Sometimes these challenges are so huge and insurmountable, but the people are demanding it, they're getting frustrated. So what a leader has to do is say, no scare them, go get them. 
and surround yourself with good people. I was blessed with this guy, Gordon Bruce, who I selected in my cabinet. I refer to him because he's the gentleman that led the charge. And I was there, I had his back, and we made sure everybody in the city and county forum understood that. I want to do the same at the state level, with the same process that we did at the city and county for Honolulu, because I believe at the end of the day, that worker feels that it'll make Thank his you. job more efficient, he'll Thank make you. it happen. Senator Ike. Thank you. And, you know, a lot of those questions uh, faced me when I took on, on the project for taking the Senate paperless. I've always believed that we have good, committed public servants throughout state government, and most of them know the answers to make government more efficient. It really is about empowering them and supporting them and working through that. The first three me meetings that I had on paperless, it was like a stone wall. Nobody believed that we were committed to make a change or make a difference. You identified that key first project to take their priorities and implement it. And once they believe that you're serious and you're committed, and this isn't just going to be the same old, same old of talking and doing nothing, but then it was like a dam burst. Every single meeting got better and better. The employees, they know what will take to be more efficient. We just need to empower them. I just want to remind everybody that the League of Women Voters in the back has the pros and cons for the ballot issues. And I'm assuming you ladies back there will force them to take them. Like you'll get up at the door when they're leaving if all else fails. It's really important that you pay attention to that and make sure that we're all knowing what we're voting on. And a reminder that walk-in voting starts October 21st. There are five locations around the island, Alpuni Center in Hilo, Nanavali Community Center, a brand new location, as well as Waimea Community Center, West Hawaii Civic Center, and which one did I forget? It'll come to me, and it'll be in the online information. Okay. We're now going to talk about a topic that has suddenly become very near and dear to the hearts of Hawaii Island people, and that is cesspools. <laughs> and we're going to go to Mr. Hanneman first on this one. The Department of Health wants to get rid of cesspools in the state. For our island, that's 50,000 cesspools, 50,000 existing cesspools, more than half that exist in the state. And these homes may or may not have room for septic tanks, the county may or may not have sewer connections coming. The rule change also requires installation of separate wastewater treatment facilities for subdivisions with 15 homes, whereas the current rule is 50 homes. For new homes, at first glance, it seems reasonable to ban cesspools, but for existing homeowners, you're looking at physical site challenges and huge expense potentially. So, I'd like to ask you, how would you as governor direct your Department of Health so there's a less drastic approach to the problem? But really what I want you gentlemen to do is talk about how you would deal with this problem because it's really causing a lot of issues for Hawaii Island people. And you have two minutes. Mr. Hanneman first. I have heard this quite resoundingly uh, as my travels throughout the Big Island to do talk story sessions. Uh, let me just say and be very clear. Uh, this would not have happened under the Hanneman administration. Uh, as governor, I would have uh, asked my Department of Health, don't even think about it. It's going to raise the cost of doing business. It's going to raise the cost of living. Uh, we have to be much more reasonable. I would have brought this issue before the Hawaii Council of Leaders, and I'm sure every county mayor, especially your mayor, would have spoke out very strongly against this. I would have convened a meeting, therefore, with the health department and those who are pushing this uh, change, try to find common ground, try to find a compromise to do this. But to me, this was uh, totally unexpected. It caught a lot of people unawares. Uh, and that's the kind of thing I think if you have an executive who is a Johnny on the spot, knows what's going on, but these regular consultations with county mayors and being a former mayor himself, this would have never happened. It never would have come out. And so if we have to do this to comply with health standards and the like, you know, let's find out how we can do it. And if we're going to do something like this, then it has to be done with a lot of education, and it has to be done incrementally in phases. But certainly the way they're trying to do it now is going to take too much out of the pocketbook and really serve as a major disincentive 
uh, to what we need to do with everyday expenses for those who are in the business of sub subdivisions or you as homeowners who continue to be relying on cesspools. This is going to require greater investment in the kind of infrastructure that we need to do. And certainly I'm prepared uh, to sit down with county mayors and figure out how we can uh, make sure that we're in compliance all the way across the board. But we have to take into special consideration what the way of life has been on the Big Island all these years. These kind of drastic overnight changes cannot happen. Thank you. Senator Yudei, the cesspool issue. Yes. Uh, first of all, this would not ever happen in an EGA administration. You know, I, it really is about community engagement and about dialogue. I do understand that the state has a role in terms of implementing a lot of the federal mandates that are coming through. But it's ridiculous that they would go ahead, develop these rules, and drop it on the counties without any prior conversations. You know, something like this affects many, many homeowners across the state. Uh, and there needs to be more consultation from the very beginning to talk about what the requirements are from the federal government and begin the dialogue of what can we do to work together to solve this problem. It's about engaging the state and county. It's about engaging the community to really discuss the options. You know, and there may be other options that could be driven by the county level that uh, they could step up and offer um, to, to work in a, in a vacuum, develop these rules, drop it on the counties, and then uh, expect that it's happened it just be totally unacceptable in an EGA administration. It is about working together. It's about recognizing that government, regardless of whether it's federal, state, or county, uh, is government. And we need to find ways on the government side to work together to identify common goals and then really work to solve your challenges and your problems. Thank you. Mr. Ayana, cesspools. <laughs> now that I've heard uh, my opponent's position on this, I'm going to make a public uh, appeal right now to the current administration and uh, their department to stop this process right now so that we don't have to deal with this when either one of us get into office because like my colleagues up here, I don't believe that this has been a fair and, and impartial process at this point in time. And so I would ask the current administration to stop it and uh, wait until the new administration uh, takes office. This obviously is something that uh, needs, as has been mentioned here, uh, you, you know, it needs further dialogue. Uh, it, is, it is specific to this uh, specific community and what you all go through and what you have in regards to infrastructure. It, it is a matter of cost. It is a matter of economics, and uh, if there is public health and safety involved in this, then we need to balance it. But the way it's being done, this process is just not fair, and as such, I reiterate what I had said earlier, and I ask this, uh, this administration to stop this process. Thank you, Mr. Iona. I have two business-related questions, and we're going to start with you, Senator Ige, for the first one. Hawaii for years has not been considered friendly to business, and this is not news to all of you. You've heard it before. Could you discuss one way, one way you might help change that perception, one specific program you would implement? We're looking not for the generality, since we all believe that Hawaii can be friendlier to business, but one program, and please take two minutes and tell us, Senator Ige, what you would do. I know, I know that it, I'll get to the specific, but it does require a, a culture change within the departments. I do believe that government in Hawaii has really been organized to support big business and big agriculture. And a lot of the departments and a lot of the processes and a lot of the rules and regulations are really geared toward that. Uh, and I have heard from many, many businesses and farmers across the state uh, that they have a tough time dealing with regulation. Uh, so, I mean, simply it is about turning state government upside down so it can be responsive uh, and flexible to meet the needs of small business. It is really sitting down, rolling up your sleeves, picking anything. We talk about uh, Department of Health permits and really going through the rules and regulations and, and trying to decide which things are really must-do core function of protecting health and safety of our communities and those things that are just really a burden to businesses and really add no value uh, to the business or no value to state government. 
So it's, it's not a pretty thing. It's really going through, uh, picking an area, uh, working through and identifying all the rules and regulations and requirements that are there, and then getting rid of the ones that really don't add value. It's about being smart about how we can support, support small business. Thank you. Mr. Hanneman, can you cite one specific change you would make, one specific program that would help this state be friendlier to business? Two minutes. Absolutely. I believe the governor needs to lead by example. And having had the fortunate experience of dealing with major companies or organizations to entice them to come to Hawaii, whether it was the National Football League to keep the Pro Bowl here, whether it was Disney uh, to put a resort uh, out in uh, West Oahu, uh, those are the kind of skills that I bring. So the first test case is going to be a governor willing to tackle the issue of bringing back the inter-island ferry service. No question, a major black eye for Hawaii. The ship was sailing, it was doing well, and then a court decision stopped it because of EIS. That has left a major black mark. And that's why I'm willing to take on that issue because 87% of you say you want it. What that's going to require is someone with knowledge of the federal government grants process, as I've done with the U.S. Department of Transportation, get it into the STIP program so we can be eligible for funds out of the Department of Transportation, working with labor, making sure we support uh, things that will make it happen, like the American shipbuilding industry and the like, and also being able, at the end of the day, to say to a business, come to Hawaii now, because we will have your back this time around. We will go out into the community. We will collaborate. And if someone wants to have a different ideal about this, let us run interference for you and make sure that we're all on the same page. If we bring, that, that, bring back that ferry service, I believe it will go a long way to dispelling the image that don't put your money in Hawaii because it may not be there for the long term because government will run from you if something occurs. I want government to run ahead. I want the companies to know Come to Hawaii and do it on our terms. Create good quality jobs. Be here for the long run. And we want you to give back to the community in charitable contributions and the like. So that one act alone, I believe, will go a long way. And because of my background in being pro-business, pro-economy, pro-jobs, we'll change the Thank culture you. overnight. Mr. Iona. It really goes back to my, uh, my opening remarks in regards to saying to create a business-friendly environment you need to have someone who is committed to that. And I am the only one who has committed to that and who has stated that we start by, we start that, we start with that commitment by saying that I am going to get government out of the way so businesses can thrive. That's not, that's not just a mere slogan. It, it, is a, it is a positive action. It is something that is going to be done. I will look for ways in which we can make businesses much more profitable and thrive and have the trust in their government public service that they will do what's best for government not just talk not just rhetoric not as just was, was stated generalities not pipe dreams but something real i was at a forum last night and found out that the state of hawaii has raised the registration fee fees for caregivers to a thousand dollars what's the relevance to that Where's the business relevance to that and the business usefulness to that? I don't know. I think the only thing that, that's, that's useful is that it goes into the general fund and nothing more. Things of that nature. In particular, in talking to many, many, many small businesses out there, in particular to the contracting field, the biggest hurdle they have is the permitting process, the entitlement process. Why can't we get that done? Well, again, one of the tools for the executive branch is the power to convene. This is something I would work with the counties on, the mayors and the council, as well as the legislature, to make sure that we do something that can put leverage on this permitting process. So I would propose that what we do is that we have a time limit in regards to permitting. In other words, 45 days, no decision on the permit, the permit is automatically approved. California has been doing this since the 1970s. That's just a small step in creating a business-friendly environment. Thank you. Second question, Mr. Hanneman, we're going to go to you first because you sort of started to address this. The state and certainly this county have worked very hard to attract new businesses and new industries to provide a diversified and broader economy or to expand industry that we already have. 
but not every person who lives here agrees with decisions made by business leaders and even courts to bring these businesses here. So how will you as governor ensure that new business partners can feel confident about investing in Hawaii, that their projects will actually come to fruition? Two minutes, please. I think they'll look at my track record as the mayor of Honolulu, uh, where we engaged in a lot of public-private partnerships. The revitalization of Waikiki, uh, which led to, to many discussions with potential investors to revitalize Waikiki. They'll go back and tra track the record. Was he pro-business? Did he help to expedite the permitting process? Did he understand what we were trying to do in that community? And that is the first step. I'm the only one here that has that record at the executive level. And that's what they want to know. They want to know how the governor feels about it. They want to know how the mayor feels about that. Then, in terms of the issues that may be contentious, it takes a governor to take that leadership role, work with the departments and make them understand that this is going to be a good business investment for Hawaii. And that's very important that the governor take that leadership role. And during that collaborative process, if a department wants to differ about it, I want them to bring it to the table so that we're all holding hands when that decision is made to go forward. When I talk to investors all the time, that's the one thing they say about Hawaii. It's a difficult place to do business. We need a champion. And I'm prepared to be a champion at the state level, just as I was a champion at the county level, and just as I was a champion in private industry. That's why I'm saying I not only bring you executive experience in the public sector, I bring you executive experience in the private sector. Everything from starting that Punalu Street Grid Big Shop and Visitor Center back in the day, in the 80s, to working uh, in the private sector as the president and CEO of the Hawaii Lodging and Tourism Association that brings me into daily contact and talks at that time with major hotel developers and the like. We need good jobs, we need quality jobs, and at the end of the day, if we're going to entice investment, whether it's from the United States or other parts of Asia, they want to know they have a business-friendly governor. It's not about words, it's about deeds that have Thank been you. done through the years. Thank you, Mr. Hanneman. Mr. Iona, when there is a contentious situation, not everybody agrees, how will you as governor ensure that the businesses feel confident in putting their money here in the county and the state? Yeah. Let, let's go back to fundamentals. It all goes back to, again, having trust in the public servant, that leadership that you have at the top. And that begins with developing relationships. And that means developing relationships not only with the companies, that you want, or the industries that you want here in the, in the uh, on Hawaii Island, but also with the community, and that's why I'm I'm a, a big proponent of that, and that's the nature of, of my being, and that is to always reach out, to always reach out to whether it's the, the ag industry, uh, whether it's ocean and marine, or whatever it may be, to reach out to the communities and hear what they have to say. This is not about you know a title or a champion. This is about what you all want. What's your vision here in the state? I mean, on this island. And, and nothing more. And so what is conducive to your island may not be conducive to Maui or, or Kauai or Oahu. And as such, it's a matter of these relationships and listening to what you have to say, that respect that we would have to listen to what you have to say. Developing the relationships with those industries that could be compatible here is a start also. But in the end, it's all about what you all want. So I wouldn't force something on you. I wouldn't try to make it happen for you. It would be something that would be a synergy that would come from the grassroots. As we say, and as they say, it's organic, and it starts from you. And from there, we develop whatever we need to develop so we can make it happen as best we can. We always know that there will be some type of maybe opposition, or some type of disagreement, or some type of conflict. But again, with relationship, with relationship, these things can be worked out. And that's what leadership is all about. Thank you, Senator Ige. You know, I, I believe that it starts with a partnership. You know, I would be very aggressive and engaged in ensuring that any of these business partner understands that Hawaii is a special place and we care about our environment. We care about our culture. Uh, and it would really be working with these people so that they understand that there are, there are certain things that need to be complied with. There are certain requirements to protect our environment. There are certain requirements to protect our cultural resources. And look for someone who is willing to be engaged and become a good 
part of our community. And then it's about having that conversation about what kind of business or what business opportunity they would be interested in pursuing and letting them know that as governor, I would be a partner for those businesses who are really committed and understand that Hawaii is a special place and willing, really willing to work with government, to work through the issues that may come up in communities. Uh, because I believe that those types of investors, those types of businesses, those types of partners truly add value to our community and if we can find the appropriate partners, then we can move forward to build businesses and build a Hawaii that all of us can be proud of. Thank you. I want to turn to agriculture. And we're going to go to Mr. Iona first. Clearly, agriculture is important for the state, but certainly for this island. So we'd like to know, two minutes, what steps would your administration take to increase profitable farming in Hawaii? Two minutes, please. Two minutes to answer something that's very complex in regards to Hawaii Island, and not just Hawaii Island, but I think across the, uh, the other neighbor islands. You know, agriculture is a big part, I believe, in regards to what we call our naturally competitive industries. We know that we can have diversified agriculture uh, in the state uh, across the board. I'm a proponent and I'm a supporter of all forms of agriculture. I understand the balance that we need between, you know, whether it's the floral industry, whether it's the, the, you know, the, the food industry, whatever it may be in regards to agriculture. But I also know that we have to balance this with the other concerns that we have out there. But I'm prepared to do what it takes. I, I know that the, the legislature has tried to incentivize more farmers to, to, to get into agribusiness by you know, making some modifications and amendments and increasing the funding for agricultural loans. I know for a fact that uh, you know, we've done more in regards to biosecurity. I know we need to do much more so that we can help our agriculture industry to thrive in the state of Hawaii. I also know the challenges in regards to shipping, you know, transportation costs and water. I know that those are big issues that we have here in the state of Hawaii for our agriculture industry. And I'm willing to work towards all of that. But as I did in, you know, in the previous uh, you know, uh, engagements that I've had up here in, the, in Hawaii Island and across the state, I want to meet with that industry. I want to meet with the community and find out again what all of their concerns are so we can sit down and make it happen. Because that's really what it's going to take. But I am committed. I know for a fact that what we want is more food security. Shipping in 80 to 85% of our food is, is just not the way to go. But I believe that we can be much more you know, self-reliant and self-dependent on ourselves in regards to, to, to producing food in the state of Hawaii. Thank you. Mr. Hanneman, what steps would your administration take to increase profitable farming in Hawaii? My six and a half years with Seymour and Company gave me a deep and profound appreciation for diversified ag, especially on this island, and known as being the agricultural breadbasket. And I really believe that our best years of agriculture is in front of us rather than behind us. So let's begin with changing the status of the Department of Agriculture. Currently, they get only 0.7% of the budget of state government. How can they afford to go out and do what they need to do? I was in a talk story session in White Mail this past weekend, where a farmer told me about uh, the issues that he's facing with invasive species, where the state is so quick to issue a fine, as opposed to come with a long-range solution on how they're gonna eradicate these species uh, in, that is uh, infiltrating uh, his farm. This is, can be done. We have to fully fund it. We have to make sure that the inspectors are out there. And then we have to be much more ag friendly than we've ever had before. To the big farmers, the small farmers, they're also engaging now in new technology. Aquaponics is a new industry in many ways. So I want to be very friendly. I want to be able to look at what we can do to help, uh, especially the fact that farmers often have difficulty with getting long-term leases. Farmers have difficulty in getting loans from the banks and the like. We have to go back with an understanding with appreciation of agriculture. If we want food security, if we want to make sure that we grow more of our products here and be able to put out on the world market products from Hawaii that are grown here that will help change the image that we have, but more importantly recognize that we still have things here in Hawaii that we can produce, not just for our local people, but also for consumption for those around the world that love to have the Hawaii brand name whether it's corner coffee, now Kau coffee, all those things is really what I want to do. 
I want to bring back the agriculture industry to make them understand there's someone in the executive office that understands the importance of agriculture. Thank you. Senator Ike. When I started my campaign for governor uh, more than a year ago, I really thought that agriculture was dead in Hawaii. Um, you know, as I visited and talked with farmers, you know, I talked with the nurseries here on the Big Island, uh, and they talked about um, the opportunities, about the fact that they've learned how to make a profit in the business. They've learned how to put up high value on their crops and where those markets are, and most importantly, figured out how to structure their product so that they can maximize the profit and the opportunities. I met with the farmer uh, in Puna, looking to establish and be totally self-sufficient, you know, looking at natural farming for his pig farm. You know, I was amazed to walk on his farm and in the middle of the pig farm, all I smelled was macadamia nuts and papayas. Uh, there was not the usual stench that you would expect at a pig farm. And he talked about his vision for, for planting and becoming even more self-sufficient by generating and producing biodiesel fuel. You know, I went to Kauai, met with farmers in Kekaha. I met with farmers on Maui. I am more bullish about agriculture now than I ever have been uh, because of my interactions with the many farmers across the state. We need to help and support all farmers, big and small. We need to turn the Department of Agriculture upside down so they understand that it's also about supporting the small farmers. You know, so what does that look like? We need to make investments in the University of Hawaii so we can have the extension agents that can be the conduit to the farmers across the state to teach them about new techniques and ways to be more profitable. You know, we need to start with the farmers and ask them, what would it take to double your production? I'm excited about this opportunity, and I believe that agriculture can be a big part of our economy moving forward. Thank you. I have a one-minute follow-up, and it has to do with invasive species. You all probably know that we find it really amusing when you get a koki frog on Oahu or the fire ants, and you all spring into action, you all meaning the state. So the question is, one minute, what kind of commitment will you make to this island to address those invasive species when they land here first, Mr. Henneman? 100% commitment. That's what this farmer was talking to me about, the fire ants, and he's just totally frustrated. Because all he's doing is paying fine after fine after fine, with no plan from the state to eradicate this. So let's be proactive from the beginning. Let's make sure that the inspectors are spending as much time inspecting what's going out, as, as opposed to what's coming in, and make sure that we're vigilant about it, we prohibit these things from occurring. That's very, very important. So we will get 100% commitment because I've always been a supporter of agriculture. I changed the culture in the city and county of Honolulu where we did farmer's markets in the city as opposed to the rural areas. I believe in agriculture. It wasn't an epiphany that came to me during the course of a campaign. I have always been a supporter of agriculture and I will continue to make sure we get rid of this invasive species problem. Thank you. Senator Ige. You know, the invasive species problem can only be defeated if we recognize and acknowledge that it has to be a comprehensive program that involves state, county, the farmers, and the distributors to really tackle, tackle and stop the spread of invasive species. I met with nursery farmers on the Big Island, and they were appalled that they had a hand in spreading koki frogs throughout our communities. They were not aware. It's not like they're the enemies. They really are part of the solution. So it starts with understanding that all of those four sectors have to be part of the solution. The state, the county, uh, farmers, and the distributors, because it has to be comprehensive. We need to work together. We need to identify ways that we can stop importation. And then most importantly, we have to be able to identify where they are and stop them from, from spreading across the state. Thank you. Mr. Ayano, will you be here for this island relative to invasive species? <laughs> Absolutely. It's, uh, you know, we have to be real about this also, understanding that uh, invasive species will make its way no matter how vigilant or how many resources we have committed to the problem. But therein lies the, uh, the issue, and that is what's the commitment, what's the priority. 
Uh, I believe that we don't have the necessary resources and personnel to, uh, to do the best job that we can. And that's really all that you can do, is do the best you can. So biosecurity, inspection programs, inspection resources need to be there. I was mentioned earlier, both in and out of the state of Hawaii. And so with that, you have my commitment to put the type of resources that we need, to put the type of personnel we need so that we can minimize as best as we can any invasive species that is taking over the state of Hawaii, such as the ones that were mentioned tonight. Thank you. We want to turn to tourism. And I'm, I'm going to give you 30 seconds for the first question, but it's really a yes, no question. Tourism is clearly, after government, the biggest employer here on Hawaii Island. And right now there's support from Hawaii Tourism and State DOT at the highest levels to get the customs facility back at Kona Airport. So as a new governor, where will this be on your priority list for Department of Transportation? Do you support getting customs back to Kona Airport? Senator Ige, yes, no? Absolutely, yes. It, it's highest priority. Okay. Mr. It's yes, yes. Okay. Mr. Iona. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so that's a good thing. Now, that means we hopefully will get more folks here, but already we have a lot of people who come to this island, and if they want to stay in a hotel on the west side of Hawaii Island, they have many, many choices. But on the east side of Hawaii Island, we have some issues, particularly with Hilo's Banyan Drive area. The State Department of Land and Natural Resources controls the land and the leases, and it is well recognized that they do poor oversight and they have poor lease terms. So other than the Gila Hawaiian, the hotels have not been upgrading and at least one is completely substandard. So two minutes, give us your plan to remedy that situation. We will start with you, Mr. Iona. Well, obviously this is something that involves leadership and it involves something that has to be changed from the top. Uh, it's about, as we, we've been mentioning all night long, it's about discussion, it's about collaboration, it's about understanding what the community needs are and working towards a common ground. So this is something that you would have to do starting with the DLNR and working with the, uh, the owners and, and the, uh, the prospective uh, investors in these, these various hotels and, uh, that you have on Banyan Drive. Uh, nothing more said on that than other than to work with them and, and do what's best for the community. This is not about DLNR, this is not about the state, it's not about me, it's not about anyone but the people of the state of Hawaii and how we, or I should say the people of Hawaii Island, and how we can best serve you so that you can get the best benefit out of a piece of our property that will, you know, hopefully attract more tourists or attract more visitors so that this can play into your plans in regards to this side of Hawaii Island and what needs to be done. Thank you. Senator Ike. Yes, uh, it, I believe that it's, it's about partnership and, and being willing to work, uh, again, state, city, um, working through this. I know that uh, Mayor Kinoy has talked a lot about um, synergy, about he could bring and that he would be willing uh, to be an active partner in the redevelopment of, of Banyan Drive. And I would look forward to having that conversation with him about what his specific ideas might be. I do believe we need to talk with the visitor industry to talk about what are the challenges with the leases. It is clear that the way that the state issues these leases and how it works uh, with the industry is just doesn't work. It doesn't encourage investment. It doesn't uh, encourage the development of a tourism plant that really uh, would make Kigo proud. Uh, so it's about working with the industry, uh, developing that plan and understanding what kinds of leases would encourage investment. It's about working with the mayor and city and county about what ideas he might have uh, to either work with the state or take over marketing and, and, and uh, promotion of those uh, properties. Uh, we need to look to work together to identify what would allow us to move forward in a way uh, to redevelop that area so that we can bring more jobs and more visitors to the east side. Thank you. Mr. Hanneman. Who's very well versed in the tourism industry, I've always maintained this. You can do all the marketing in the world to bring people to a particular place, but if you don't have the hotel room inventory, if you don't have upgraded and modernized hotels, if you don't have a nice place for them to come, they will not come. And this problem has existed for many, many years under a Democratic administration, under a Republican administration. You have my word that I will make this a top priority. Billy Kinoy is anxious to move forward from the county level. What he needs is a state partner that recognizes the urgency as much as he does. 
It's a shame that we've allowed this problem to continue to fester with no solution in sight. This is where leadership comes in. If we have to change what's there with respect to the leasing agreement, and let's figure out how we can do it. Let's bring the best legal minds to figure this out. Let's move this forward, but you're never gonna realize any kind of tourism potential here in the East Hawaii unless you upgrade your hotel room inventory. And now more than ever, we have to do that, and I'm prepared to do that with my strong tourism background that understands the importance of visitors and what they bring to the community, and most importantly, the jobs that they create, and also a place, not just for visitors, but for local people to go and enjoy. You have the Merry Monarch Festival, and every year we know, when you come here, that's the, the rates get raised incredibly in that area, and that's the only thing that you have, and people go, wow, I paid a lot to stay there. Let's change it, let them say, you know, I love the Merry Monarch Festival, I paid a high rate at certain hotels, and it was a wonderful experience all around. That's what I want to see here, and you have my commitment to change that. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Homelessness. I know you're going to say, Ms. Rayona, two minutes is not enough to talk about it, and I think all of you would agree with that, but we do want to get a summary of what your plan is to address it. Clearly, the problem of homelessness is far more severe on Oahu than it is here, but we're feeling it here on Hawaii Island. So starting with you, Mr. Hanneman, talk about your solution and to what extent it would apply here on Hawaii Island for homelessness. Two minutes, please. I applaud Governor Abercrombie and Mayor Caldwell uh, for doing what they're trying to do to uh, come about with solutions for Oahu, especially in Waikiki. But therein lies the problem. You have a homeless problem here. You have a homeless problem on Kauai. You have a homeless problem on Maui. It should be a collaborative solution. And once again, I go back to the beauty of having a Hawaii Council of Leaders, where together we can come at solutions that will benefit all of the state of Hawaii as opposed to just one area. We've had a lot of experience at the county level on how to do that in Waikiki when I was mayor, and the problem was always trying to find solutions for the homeless once you remove them from the parks, the streets, and the like. And the state is well equipped to step up to the plate and be a partner. We don't have a Department of Education at the county level. We don't have a Department of Health at the county level. And mental health services that were drastically cut with the Lingo Iona administration is something that we have to catch up to because 60% of the people who are chronically homeless need mental health services and treatment. So this is gonna take a collaborative approach. It's gonna to have to also bring the social service nonprofit providers, and then the communities also have to be engaged. I hear a lot of times people say, get rid of the homeless in my community. But when you ask them, can they stay in a part of your community, perhaps where a housing first project can be built, or where we can have a temporary shelter for them, Everyone is quick to respond, I don't like it. just get them out. And we also have to be part of the solution. So this is something that's gonna really involve all of us because it's not gonna be an easy problem. But we have some light at the end of the tunnel. The Department of Veterans Affairs is making a lot of grants available to cities and state that want to tackle the homeless problem with respect to the veterans. And I wanna maximize every federal grant and opportunity in that Thank area. you, Mr. Hanneman. Senator Ige. Yes, the homeless uh, challenge is really a challenge that all of us have to step up to. It really is about getting state, federal, county government, communities, and the private sector to work together uh, to solve this challenge. Uh, yes, homelessness has reached each and every community across the island. But the model that we are using and that appears to work is really about housing first, finding partners, and I believe in each and every community, that can provide emergency shelters so we can get people off the street. It's about triaging the homeless, identifying those that are most motivated to leave that state of homeless. We should focus on those, those people first, those pe individuals and families, uh, because they, they are willing to be part of the solution. It's about providing the full range of benefits and programs that the state, county, and federal government can provide. So it's about mental health services uh, for those who have mental health issues. It's about substance abuse services for those who may have become addicted. 
It's about providing health services and community health centers and other providers uh, if, those, uh, if they have health issues. It's about access to federal benefits. 10% of the homeless across the state are veterans and are entitled to a wide array of federal programs and, and benefits if we were aware. So it's working at all of those levels. And then finally, uh, there have been proposals by private sector people who would be willing for those homeless who have come to Hawaii in the belief that being homeless in Hawaii is better than being homeless in Nebraska or Alaska or wherever they're from, we ought to explore the option of, of giving them the airfare to send them back because that will reduce our homeless problem here by one. Thank you. Mr. Iona, the homeless problem and how it would impact Hawaii Island. A complex problem that has exploded across the state of Hawaii. We're in now that the health and safety of not only the homeless community, but everyone at large is at risk. And so this is something that needs immediate action. Now, what we have proposed is something that could be a supplement and a complement to the programs that have already been enacted in various counties. First and foremost, a mobile homeless court. A homeless court wherein you have the option now of getting treatment and, and whatever else you need in regards to services via the judiciary. Second, as already has been mentioned, 10% of the homeless population are made up of veterans. The U.S. Vets Association, which is not a part of the administration, the U.S. Vets Administration, which is a nonprofit, is only one of 11 that's here in the state of Hawaii. They have the resources, they have the capacity to take in vets so that they can be lined up with the services and the other resources that are needed. The only problem they have is that the outreach that they're having to these vets are not taking place because they don't relate to the people who are outreaching to them. So as Commander-in-Chief of the National Guard, I would make it a specific program for our men and women in the, in the uh, National Guard to be outreach workers, to reach out to our vets and to bring them into these services. Now it's been said many times that we have states out there who have specific programs wherein they actually buy one-way tickets for their homeless to come to Hawaii because the benefits are easier and hey, let's, let's, be, let's be real. 365 days of sunshine and nice weather. Well, I want to put this out to my colleagues out there when I become governor and that's this. If we have evidence that this is taking place intentionally, we're going to buy a one-way ticket and send it back at your expense. Last but not least, we're going to have what I would call being proactive and having what we call being prevented in the sense of closing gates in the judiciary, in the public, in the prison system, Thank and you. in the military. Thank you. I'm going to ask a one-minute follow-up on this. Senator Egate, do you have a sense of the cost implications of your homeless solution? One minute, and where would the money come from? Well, a lot of these uh, programs are already appropriated um, by state government, so we do have mental health services. Uh, the uh, federally qualified health centers provide uh, health benefits to uh, many people who are uninsured, homeless, and otherwise. So it really is about organizing and coordinating resources already committed to help people who are less fortunate. Uh, so the actual impact or cost would be relatively small. The big cost really is about um, housing and emergency shelters. And then it would be looking to work with the counties and other nonprofit um, community uh, organizer, organizations who would be able to help us identify uh, homeless solutions in each and every community. Thank you. Mr. Hanneman, what are the cost implications of your solution? One minute only, please. I think this really goes to the heart of prioritizing the budget and making this part of the budget sacrosanct, that you're not going to cut as much if you're going to cut. And most importantly, leveraging every county grant, every state grant, every federal grant, and then in some instances, as we've seen in Waikiki, the hoteliers are willing to step forward uh, to help contribute uh, financially to the homeless problem. So I really believe it takes creativity with the budget and making sure that everybody understands that this has to be a priority and we're going to do everything possible when it comes down to it. But I go back to the Housing First proposal that David spoke to and I agree with. I tried to do it when I was a mayor of Honolulu with Kirk Caldwell was my managing director, and it really came down to nimbyism. It was an area that we picked out on Oahu, perfect. The city owned the facility, but the community did not want it, so we had to basically put the program on the shelf. 
So you really need to participate in it so we can all be part of the solution and not just be part of the problem. Mr. Ayana, the cost implications? In, in regards to our specific programs, very minimal. But in regards to everything else, I don't believe there should be a price tag on, on this. This is a priority. This is a commitment. And so the funds need to be, they need to be appropriated, plain and simple. Thank you. I'm now going to ask each one of you to tell us what you see as the differences between what you will bring to the job and what your opponents will bring to the job. And this is a two minute question and I would like to start with Mr. Iona first. First and foremost, I am the, uh, the only one on this panel up here who has had the opportunity and the experience to actually be in the executive office. Now much will be said about the office of the Lieutenant Governor, but the only responsibility, the only mandate, the only legal mandate that you have as a Lieutenant Governor is to be ready to become Governor. In other words, as we have a, a mantra amongst our LGs, and that's this, you're one heartbeat away from being Governor. I've had that opportunity to serve for eight years as LG. I've been asked many times by my opponents up here, well, what have you done? What decisions have you made? And you've heard the referral, the Lingo Iona administration. Well, I, you know, it's something that comes with that opportunity to serve as Lieutenant Governor. But all of you know that the decisions made by Governor Lingo are made by Governor Lingo because it's her administration. She is the governor. And that's why we're vying for governor as opposed to Lieutenant Governor. So that we can make the decisions. And so I, I relish that. That's the biggest difference we have. I've been there in the good times and the bad times. First four years that we had in 2002 to 2006, if you remember, the economy was booming. 204, 205, 206. I saw the decisions that were made, I saw what was happening, and I learned from that. In our second term for 2006 to 2008, the worst recession, recession in the United States hit us. Talk about a bottoms out. Wake up one day and let's just say you wake up one day and 20% of your income is no longer there. You open your bank account and there it is, 20% gone. Just like that. That's exactly what happened with Governor Lingo and the decisions that she had to make. I was witness to that. I had input in regards to that. I heard what was made and I saw the pains that she had to go through to make the decisions she had to make. There's no one better qualified to step in right now and become governor of the state of Hawaii. Thank you. Senator Ike, what are the main differences between you and your opponents? Um, I, I believe there are many differences, but let me just focus on a few. I'm the only candidate with 34 years of private sector experience. I have been committed for all of my public sector career to maintain my profession as an engineer and business executive because I believe that it made me a better legislator. I've worked from Fortune 500 companies to to private equity, business, venture capital startup. And I really do understand the ranges and challenges of business issues that are faced by many of you business people. I have 29 years of legislative experience. I have been able to get past significant changes in legislation from charter public school reform to charter bills to, to auto insurance reform. I'm the only one that have a proven track record of working with colleagues and having relationships with Speaker Suki and Chairman Luke and, and uh, Senator Tokuda and Senate President Kim that can work with them to get things done. You know, I have relationships with the unions. We don't agree all the time, but you know, my experience has been that in 90% of the issues, there is alignment between management and union. You know, they both, the HSPA wants to see children learn. You know, they want the best public school system that we can have, and that's totally aligned. I have relationships with all of the unions. I can challenge them when it needs to be. I can work with them when it's to our advantage. You know, and finally, I am the only true collaborator. What you guys see is what you get. They've been trying to change me, how I talk, how I speak. They can't do it. It is what it is. I'm the only collaborator. I have 30, 29 years of working with people to get things done. You can't manipulate me. You can't train me to be a better speaker. It is what it is, and I'm proud to be that. Thank you. 
Thank you. Mr. Hanneman. Mr. Hanneman, before we go to closing statements, two minutes on what you see as the main differences between you and your opponents. This is a job, again, that takes real executive experience. Senator Eagy has been a wonderful legislature, but a legislative, legislative skills does not translate into an executive job. Ten, four years ago, I tried to explain the difficulty that our current governor would have going from strictly a legislative career and trying to make the transition to being an executive. It's like taking someone who's been playing on the offensive line all the years in football, and suddenly one year you say to him, I want you to be the quarterback with no prior training. In a private sector career that only had maybe 100 employees under his watch is not enough to allow him to hit the ground running. I respect Duke Iona and what he's done in the judiciary. But once again, judiciary skills or being a lieutenant governor as an observer does not translate into a governor that can hit the ground running from day one. That's exactly what is required in this job, and I beg to differ with Senator Ige. Just because I'm an independent doesn't mean those relationships that I had in collaboration with the legislature is going to go away. Senator Suki and I have been, Speaker Suki and I have been longtime friends. Four years ago, he endorsed me for governor. Senate President Donna Mercado Kim is my neighbor from our Hanabata days in Kalihi. Those relationships remain. Chan Tsutsui, who's running for lieutenant governor, endorsed me for governor four years ago. This is Hawaii. It's all about where you in school, where you hang out, who are your friends. Those relationships will remain intact. And that's why you have to have someone with real executive experience because you are tired of the problems that have been nagging you for years. Highest energy prices in the country, highest cost of living, affordable housing is just out of control. Bring someone in with real executive experience who can collaborate with Democrats, Republicans, business and labor and do what you want them to do as opposed to what the party tells them to do or Thank partisan you. bricky bickering that doesn't get Thank anywhere. Thank you, Mr. Hanneman. However, since you are the first up on the closing statement, you may continue. Each candidate is allowed to make a closing statement of two minutes, anything they would like to say. Two minutes, Mr. Hanneman. I believe you all deserve a well round of applause for staying for two hours to listen to three politicians talk to you. Give yourselves a hand. It's been wonderful this evening. Thank you very much. But as I said earlier, if you are tired of the same old, same old approaches of solutions that don't get us anywhere, or the same old, same old campaign style, look at what's happening right now before your very eyes on television. Democratic ads attacking the Republican nominee. Republican ads criticizing the Democratic nominee. What about you, the people? What about the ideas and solutions that we need to do to move this state and this county forward? Why not? Why not try something new? In life, when something's not working, when you're a coach and something's not working, you try a new play. You try a new way. You try a different way. That is what this state needs. Somebody who truly understands all of the islands, not just Oahu. Someone who can work with Democrats, Republicans, independents, business, labor, the community to do what we need to do to move us forward. My Lieutenant Governor running mate has executive experience as a retired Air Force Colonel overseeing 8,000 employees and billion dollars in revenues in Okinawa. You see, you have a team that's already been working together for six years. So you don't have to worry whether they're going to get along or not. We got along for six years at the city and a cabinet that left the city of Honolulu better than we found it. So we want to take that skill set, we want to take that ability to listen to the people and make it happen. This idea of the Inter-Island Ferry Service didn't come from me, it came from you. 87% of the people of Hawaii want to see it happen. And that's the style of leadership that we will do. You want something, we'll go back and come back with a realistic, honest plan of how we can collaborate and do it together. Because it's all about the future, it's all about our keiki, and it's making sure that Hawaii is the thank best you, place Mr. in the world. Mahalo, and thank you for being here this evening. Senator Ige, two minute closing statement. Thank you. I did want to thank the Hawaii Island Chamber of Commerce for uh, hosting this this evening. I wanted to thank all of you for sitting through and being willing to listen and hear our, our views of, of what um, being governor will be to each of us. You know, I, what you see is what you get. I mean, I, I am who I am. I've tried to be a better speaker, and sometimes I'm successful and sometimes not. 
But this election really is about the future of Hawaii. It's about the future that you and I want to leave for our children and our children's children. You know, I do have three children. I have worked hard to maintain my private sector career because I believe that it made me a better legislator. I truly believe that the point that I felt that I was a legislator over an engineer or a business person, I needed to get out of that business. But I've been inspired to continue to provide public service because that allows me the opportunity to change Hawaii in a way that I would never be able to do it in the private sector. I decided to run for governor because it became clear to me that you want a change in leadership style. You're tired of competing community against community, fighting about issues, when most of the time we have common goals and objectives. I bring to you a new style of leadership that will bring our communities together to find common goals and find solutions that move our communities forward. It's about making investments in public schools, about empowering schools, I understand it really is about the teacher in the classroom. We need to empower schools, deliver resources to the communities and teachers, and let them make the decisions. This election really is about the future of Hawaii. I ask you to support Lieutenant Governor Sutsui and myself. I ask you for your vote on November 4th. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Iona, two minutes, please. First of all, thank you to all the sponsors and to all of you who are here tonight. As uh, Ufi mentioned, two hours is a long time, and I thank you for that. The choice is clear in this, in this campaign, in this election. You know, I like to think that uh, my colleague to the left of me, Mr. Hanneman, um, and I'll use the word that he used tonight, had this epiphany of being independent as a result of, well, he ran as a Democrat in 2010 and didn't get the result he wanted ran in 2012 as a Democrat and didn't get the result he wanted. And maybe that epiphany came after those two uh, campaigns. But the bottom line is this, that you have this choice. You can either just do the kind of change that they're talking about where you change out the leadership, but you have the same system, the same system that has brought you the highest cost of living, that has caused us to be the most taxed in the United States, that has throttled small businesses, for years and years and years, and as such, we are the worst place to make a living. Or, you can vote for a governor that's going to take you in a new direction, because that's what I'm hearing. A governor who is committed, the only one who is committed to saying that we're going to have a business-friendly environment, that is committed to getting government out of the way of businesses and looking for ways to cut the cost of living by reducing, by reducing our fees, by eliminating needless taxes, by not increasing the spending by $1.2 billion. By not approving over 40 tax increases and fee increases over the last four years. That's what you have in regards to Elwin Ahu and myself. You have a leadership team that is committed to taking you in a new direction. You know, Elwin and I, uh, as I mentioned earlier, my only, uh, uh, my only part in government has been as lieutenant governor. I really understand what trust, respect, and balance means as a result of my tenure as a judge, and so does Elwin. So come November 4th, please remember, if you want trust, respect, and balance, please vote for Duke Iona and Elwin Abu. Thank you, thank you. Before we say thank you to our candidates, let's remember that our sponsors are what make this all possible. Hawaii Island Chamber, Japanese Chamber of Commerce and Industry of Hawaii, Hawaii Island Realtors, Hawaii Island Contractors Association, Kanoe Lehua Industrial Area Association, Hawaii Island Portuguese Chamber of Commerce, and Big Island Press Club. You may watch these forums on BigIslandVideoNews.com, on Hawaii247.com, and on the Leo Hawaii. For those of you who want to see these gentlemen again, they will be at Kealakehe High School Monday at 6. Our timers, Von Cook and Mary Bajir, did a great job. That's the toughest job. And if you are still hungry, if you are still hungry, let me tell you, there is chili to go, and it's on sale for $3 or two for five. And with that, I want to ask our candidates to not go anywhere because they want to take some pictures of you. And now, let's thank our candidates for being with us tonight and doing such a great job. Thank you to all of you for being with us. We really appreciate your attention and interest. Aloha.